So, uh, welcome. I think we can start now. Um, my name is uh, Maxime Chevalier. I work at Smile. Uh, I'm based in France, in the, in the southwest of France. And I work in uh, embedded Linux development. And so, in my work, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've worked on multiple proje projects that use the preempt RT patch. And today I'm going to present you what it's like to use the RT patch um, with more of a user perspective. I'm not a real-time patch developer. So, um, does any of you use the RT patch in, in the project? All right, quite a few. <laughs> uh, so, let me just uh, present what kind of projects uh, I've worked on. So, the first one was a simulation platform. Uh, it was in the aerospace industry. Uh, it was one of these big uh, workstations with two Intel Xeons inside, loads of RAM, and we needed to run software that would simulate uh, real code that was supposed to run on a real-time operating system. So the main con constraint here was to be able to respond to uh, an event that would come on the network interface in a given time. And so uh, we also run cyclic tests on this machine, and uh, our target latency was uh, two, 200 microseconds. Uh, that's the first project. The second one was pretty similar. Uh, it was a test bench uh, that was communicating with uh, real-time software, and that was performing acquisitions on various input uh, ports. So you have this kind of uh, rack with a lot of input uh, I.O. cards. On each card, you have maybe 128 inputs, so that's a lot of things to acquire. And so when receiving a packet on the network interface, we would have one second to perform all the acquisition, uh, be it digital or analog, and respond in one second. So that, that might seem like a, a large time to respond, but uh, when the system is on the load, uh, we experience some spikes that would go over one second. Uh, the third one was a project I've worked on for two years, and which was a more embedded product. So this time we were using uh, an ARM-based platform, so an IMX6 from Freescale. Uh, so it was a product that was embedded into vehicles, like tractors, buses, trucks, and that was performing acquisition on all the vehicle bus, that's the, the CAN bus on, on this kind of vehicle. And so uh, in order to gather all of this data and never lose any incoming packet, we needed to use the real-time patch because we also needed to run some customer load on the IMX6. Uh, we, we, we didn't have any idea of the very nature of these loads, but the system could be under heavy CPU load and still needed to acquire each and every one of these packets and never lose any. So the prompt RT patch here was more for a deterministic behavior rather than real time, although uh, it's quite the same as I'm going to show you. And finally, uh, I've worked on it on an image processing solution for the medical industry, and uh, we were doing some real time processing, uh, real time not as in RTOS, but real time as, uh, as the things are happening in real life. So we have this video stream, and on each frame we need to do some processing and this processing is fed into a robotic uh, laser, I think. So uh, that's for um, medical imaging. So you are filming something and you point a laser uh, to where what you are filming in real life. And so if you have too big of a jitter or of a delay between the time you acquire the frame and the time you point a laser, you're not pointing at the right thing. So that was pretty critical in the medical industry. Uh, just to give you some feedback of what is uh, some some ground uh, for for us to be on the same ground on what is a real time operating system. Uh, so pretty much all of you know what that is with, with the quick poll. But um, uh, RTOS is all about determinism, uh, having a deterministic behavior, especially regarding timing constraints. So when you have an event that occurs, you want the response to that event to happen in a known time frame. That's what you want primarily on the RTOS. You also want to run multiple tasks. And to do so, you need to have a real-time scheduler. Uh, this scheduler will, 
will decide which task need to run given uh, a priority that is assigned to this task. And so a critical task is assigned a high priority so that it runs always before the lower priority tasks. And finally, on an RTOS, you want to handle some specific cases. Because you are running uh, multiple tasks and you are sharing resources, you have some locking mechanisms. And so uh, with um, absolute priorities on your scheduler and lockings happening on the side, you can have situations where due to this interlocking mechanism, you have a lower priority task that prevents a high priority task to run. That's called a priority inversion. Um, so we need to solve all of these problems to have uh, a real-time behavior. What do we have in Linux? Uh, in Linux, we have pretty much everything we need to have a real-time operating system. Thanks to the effort of the real-time patch, the preempt RT patch, uh, a lot of the things that were missing are now mainlined. Uh, so this is based on 4.9, but yesterday there was a pretty good talk about where things are uh, nowadays. So you have a real-time scheduler. You have three of them. Uh, Sked FIFO, which is a pretty simple one. Uh, the first task that needs to run will run uh, according to its priority. Sked RR, which is for run robin. So this is the same as Sked FIFO, but with a notion, a notion of time sharing and time slicing. And you have a Sked Deadline, which is the, the new one, which uh, basically uh, allows you to tell, uh, I need to have this work done by this deadline, no matter uh, when it will happen. Uh, but you, I need it done by uh, the next uh, 200 milliseconds, for example. We have support for uh, the priority inheritance problem. So that was the, the tricky use cases that we can have. So uh, we use uh, priority inheritance to solve the, the priority inversion problem. Uh, we have a preemptable kernel, almost, which means uh, that uh, a task can stop the kernel from running to do its job but the kernel still has a lot of critical sections in it. And so that's nowadays what the RT patch is all about. It's removing these critical sections. Uh, we have high resolution timers for, for quite a while. So we like full kernel preemption and also some uh, worst case scenario uh, optimizations. So what you have to understand is that uh, between Linux and a real-time operating system, you don't have ba basically the same approach in designing these OSs. And when you design a real-time operating system, uh, what you want to do is to be 100% sure that you will have your deterministic behavior. And in order to do so, you have to check every execution pass that you can, can, can take, measure how long it will take, and prove that you will never uh, have unbounded latencies. Uh, this is not feasible with Linux. It's impossible to do because Linux is too complex and it's moving really too fast to have this kind of verification and formal proof. So what the RT patch does, it's kind of a best effort to make everything in the kernel nice to everything else. So uh, every time we take a lock, well, we will do so that uh, instead of having non-preemptible sections with uh, interruption disabled, we try to do so that the lock is sleepable, is interruptible, you have still interruption that can occur. So you, you make so that every piece of code is nice to the rest of the kernel. To do so, uh, they introduce the threaded interrupts. So the threaded interrupts is also a mainline thing. It's just enforced in the preempt RT patch. And basically, uh, when you have an interruption that occurs, instead of running the interruption handler in a specific context uh, that would preempt everything that was previously going on, even if it was a real-time task, a high-priority task, uh, the interruption handlers are now run into dedicated threads. And so you'd still have a tiny interrupt handler, and all it does is wake up this task that is pending. Uh, the advantage of that is that you can assign a priority to this given task and make it so that it is scheduled after your critical task if you don't really care about this interruption. Uh, the locks are sleepable inside the kernel, so that's where all the magic happens. Um, you, can, uh, you, you can take a look at some, at some talks I, I give at the end uh, to really understand what is going on. 
but you have to have that in mind uh, when designing a user application is that uh, the kernel itself in the ways it, it handles the resource sharing behave differently and this has an impact on your performances and so it removes the critical sections as I said. Uh, so just a quick look at how can we determine this from the user space. I don't know if you know the tool perf. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about ftrace. You can do that with ftrace. But with perf, we, we can really see what is happening uh, to your task getting, that is running on user space. For example, here I am running uh, ping floating from my machine. And I uh, monitor what is happening using perf. So perf will. Um, uh, every now and then uh, see what current function is running inside the kernel and give you um, the percentage of how many time did you spend uh, in that function when you run your specific load. So this is the result on vanilla Linux without the preempt RT patch. So you can see that uh, you acquire and release a raw spin lock with uh, REQ saving, which means you disable the interruptions while you are, you are holding that lock. So that's not good for uh, real time, but that's kind of good for performances. Um, on the contrary, on preempt RT, uh, this lock is replaced with a RT spin lock, which is sleepable, which means that um, when you cannot acquire the lock, you will go, in, you will go to sleep and let someone, something else run. So you have a context switch here, but uh, you are nicer to the rest of the system. So. Uh, that's really just to show you uh, that the real-time patch uh, changes the, the things uh, inside the kernel. So what about uh, everything that is not uh, real-time related? Because uh, the kernel is changed, but the ABI is the same between the kernel and the user space. So you can still run everything that runs on vanilla Linux uh, if you have your JVM uh, with your custom load uh, on it, you can still run it on preempt RT and have your critical task that runs on the side. What you have to, to be aware of is that your uh, non real time task will have what is left of the resources. So, what is left of the CPU time, what is left of the memory that you've locked for your uh, critical task. I'll get into that later. So when you've applied the real-time patch, uh, what do you see exactly? So the first thing you do, you do uh, uname dash a. You see that oh, I didn't show the result of the command. Sorry. Um, you have preempt an RT in your uh, uname uh, string. Also, you have a file that is created in sys kernel real time. If you uh, look at what inside, it says one. You cannot echo zero to disable the RT patch. It's just here to say. Here, I have the RT patch applied. Another thing that you can notice and that can be confusing is what uh, happens when you do htop. Uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to do a demo, but uh, I have to reinstall the machine and I uh, don't have the RT patch running on it. But I can explain it to you. Um, what happens is that uh, you have some more tasks that are running on your system. And this is because you have threaded interrupts now. Because of that, uh, every interruption will now show in htop as, uh, as if it was a process or a task running. This can be confusing because if you have something from the, uh, external, from, from the outside of your system that is triggering interruptions, for example, the ping flood example, uh, if you are pinging your system from the outside, now the response to the ping that happens in interrupt context shows into htop and you can have your load uh, getting higher uh, in htop, but your system is still doing the same thing. So actually, when you apply the RT patch, you can visualize better what your system is doing. This will also impact your load of rage. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the load of rage. It's not really an indicator that you should rely on, but it basically tells you how many tasks are waiting to run on your system. So if it's inferior to your number of CPUs, you're fine, and if it's over to you, the number of CPUs, you're having preemption on your system, and you have more than 100% of your CPU that is used. So that will be impacted too by the preempt RT patch, just in the way that things are computed. Uh, a good set of tools that I use to, deb well, to debug, to analyze these kind of things, because 
I had to uh, prove to my customer that the preemptivity patch was having an impact, but it was not as big as we thought. So I used uh, the stat uh, tools, so PID stat, VM stat, and MP stat, which I found very useful, which allows you to uh, monitor the events that are ongoing on your system. So it allows you to analyze the context switching that happens, the interruption, the cache misses, page faults, uh, and at some uh, different levels. With VMstat, you have a global level of what is happening on your system. I will show you some example later. Uh, with MPStat, you can monitor, for example, the interruption on a per core basis. So how many interrupts are handled by the core 0, core 1, uh, how many uh, context switches, for example. And PIDStat allows you to do that on a per task basis. So. Uh, here is an example of the output you can get from VMstat, uh, the first one. VMstat, so the, the one after the common line means that I do an acquisition uh, every second and I compare what's happening to the previous second. So uh, R means how many tasks are running, IN means uh, how many interruptions happen in the last second, and CS, how many context switches happen in the last second. And I was running VMstat, and in parallel, I was running uh, StressNG uh, with a FIFO run. So StressNG is a tool that can allow you to stress some specific uh, parts of your system. It can be your CPU, your memory, uh, a bunch of system calls. And so why I am stressing uh, my system with StressNG, I can see that I have about 700,000 context switches per second. That is pretty huge. Uh, this is the same behavior on real-time and vanilla Linux. It's just to so you show you the tools. PID stat will allow you to have the same information but on a per-task basis. So, um, this, so this is one per thread. You have the PID. Uh, I didn't show it in the slide. Um, so each of these uh, processes triggered uh, 70,000 uh, 70, 70, context switches. And NV is for non-voluntary context switches. So it's the time that you get preempted by the kernel. So the kernel says you, you've run for enough time. Uh, it's time to, to let the other uh, processes run. So obviously, this is using scared other. This is not uh, some kind of real-time task. And just uh, doing what you would do on your system, regardless vanilla of preemptivity. Uh, an interesting thing to show uh, what I talked to you about with the HTOP is uh, using these tools to monitor what's happening when you have a ping float happening. Um, so that was the problem that I had to solve. So why, when I have a ping float with the real-time patch, uh, my load of rage explodes and uh, my HTOP is going crazy? And what we realize is that um, the difference between RT and vanilla Linux is just only in the way the things are, are monitored. But also, uh, the same thing in the real-time patch triggered more context switches. So you have kind of a tiny performance loss in, in that regard. You can confirm that with PID stat that uh, shows that you have roughly uh, the same amount of context which is triggered by this particular IRQ than you have uh, interruption incoming. So this is really the culprit, uh, the, the, the guilty part uh, for, for this performance loss. So this is an effect of the thread interrupts, but if that bothers you, uh, using the real-time patch, you can still assign a different priority to this particular task. Uh, you can also use iperf to compare the, the bandwidth available on the network. And iperf showed no difference at all between vanilla Linux and preemptrt, although you might think there is an impact here. But this should be uh, tested more with uh, tiny packages because the more uh, interruptions you get, the more context switches you get, and so the more time you spend switching from uh, one, one task from an to another. Um, I also use uh, StressNG a lot, so StressNG should not be used as a benchmark tool, but I did it anyway. Uh, it's a rough benchmarking tool. So if you are running something 
on vanilla Linux and you want to know how it is going to behave on real-time Linux and you know exactly what kind of load it is, so is it doing CPU intensive work like uh, doing math calculations or is it using a FIFO or is it accessing the disk uh, very quickly or the network? Uh, you can try to use TraceNG to uh, get an idea of uh, how this will behave on real time. So uh, I've used five stressors that I compared. So a stressor is the thing that uh, StressNG will run in, into a loop as quick as possible. Uh, I think you have like uh, 70 available. 90? 180? Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> but I, I limited myself to uh, the stressors when you can set the number of operations that you will run because uh, you have to compare the execution time. That, that's what I did anyway. So for the CPU, for example, uh, I've run a load that took 11 uh, seconds and in RT it took exactly 11 seconds also. It's logical because you do not go through the kernel. Uh, fault triggers a page fault and here you can see that you have a significant difference. The highest difference is the, the FIFO stressor which takes uh, 8 seconds to run on my system with vanilla Linux and 70 seconds with preempt RT. So you can see that there are areas in your kernel that will, be, uh, that will change uh, their behavior and that might be slower or faster like the Futexes that is the fast user Mutexes and that actually gets uh, faster when you have preempt RT applied. Uh, so you can use stress and that, that's what I did. It gives you a pretty good idea. Um, but so to recap the performance issues, uh, you, you can expect an overhead uh, when you run into the kernel. So when you are doing a syscall or you rely on a path that goes through the kernel, you will get an overhead. And uh, the thing is, it's very dependent on depending on your platform. So you, you, you should test it uh, very thoroughly uh, as soon as possible. Um, my point is that uh, when you use preempt RT, it's only the first step because you want to have a real-time operating system. So you must first make sure that everything you want to run on your system will still run as you expect but uh, you also have to take into account the fact that you are building a real-time operating system. And so preempt RT is the first step to build a real-time operating system. If you apply the patch, you set your critical task with your uh, SCAD FIFO, your high priority, you run cyclic test, and you see that you still have spikes in latencies. Why is that? It's because you have uh, tons of other things than the kernel that can impact your latencies. So, for example, the CPU idle state. Um, I don't know if you know what that is. The CPU idle state is basically what your CPU is doing, doing when it has nothing to do. So, for example, my laptop uh, is probably 99% of the time asleep and the, the rest of it showing my slides. So, what is my CPU doing in that time? It's not running in a, in a loop waiting to have something to do because my CPU would catch on fire. Instead, it goes to sleep, and the sleep states are depending on your architecture, on the SOC you are using, or the CPU you are using. Uh, on my system, I have 10 different uh, sleep states that I can go into, each one having a different latency, uh, different times that it takes for it to wake up. So, when you want to build a real-time operating system, you might tweak your CPU idle state and disable the the deep sleep ones in order to guarantee your latencies. Uh, it's also true with DVFS. So CPU idle states, uh, you don't have many on ARM. You basically have, uh, I think, one or two available, which is either pull in a loop or wait for an interrupt. On x86, you have tens of possible states. But DVFS is also something that you are starting to encounter on embedded systems. Uh, it's basically adjusting the frequency at which you run depending on your, the load you have on your system. And uh, this can affect your real-time behavior because if you're not running always at the same speed, how can you guarantee that you will uh, respond to an event in a bounded time? Well, in a known time. So what you want to do also is to fix the frequency at which you run. Uh, you 
uh, can also have hyperthreading on your system, and my recommendation is to disable it if you want to uh, have a real-time behavior. That was one one of the problems on the uh, big Xeon uh, systems that I used. Uh, you had a lot of CPUs and you had hyperthreading, and hyperthreading was really the thing that uh, blew our latencies. So we disabled that, and obviously, when you do that, you have very, very much less processing power. So you, you should also take that into account as soon as possible when you are designing your system. Um, the key thing about all of this is really knowing your system. So both into the software side, so your resource-based applications, what's going on in the kernel. Uh, so you don't have to necessarily know everything about the real-time patch. You can just use some uh, benchmarking tools or measuring tools to see what's happening. Uh, you also have to know your hardware because there are things that you cannot disable. For example, if you have DMA, well, you might be able to, to, to deal with it, but DMA can cause latencies uh, on the, the buses of your SOC, for example. System management mode on Intel processor or x86 processor uh, can be really helpful for your latencies. So if you don't know what SMM is, um, it was originally used on the laptops to do some thermal management. So every once in a while, you have an interrupt that fires that is not maskable, and the code that runs into that interrupt is not under control of the Linux kernel. It's inside the firmware, the BIOS, I think. And so you cannot mask it, and you don't know how much time it will take to process that particular interruption. You have tools like uh, hardware latency uh, detector that will help, help you uh, see how much time you spend in SMM. But since it's doing uh, thermal management, if you disable it, you can sometime in the BIOS, uh, your CPU will catch on fire again. So that's not recommended. And you should also uh, know if you have resources that will be shared in your hardware. I have a pretty good example that's not mine. Uh, that's one from a former talk at ELC. Uh, someone did a talk about um, running real-time uh, Linux on a multi-core system, and one of his problems was the um, single instruction multiple data, so the, the vector unit in its system was shared amongst uh, several cores. So he, I think he had four of them and eight cores, and so when he tried to run five critical tasks concurrently, it will see, he would see some really important jitter on his latencies, and because that was happening on a hardware uh, level. So things like that, you should be aware of that when you are designing your system. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick refresh on CPU idle. Um, there is actually a way to know uh, the latencies uh, that is um, that that w that it will take to to wake up your CPU from the sleep state. In the CFS, uh, you can check out. Uh, you have the, this pass, and uh, you can see how many time it will take for each state. So, for example, this is a quick uh, view of the ones that I have on this laptop. So I have tens of them. Uh, ten, and. So for the first one, which is the pole state, so in that state, you don't go sleep at all. You just run in a loop waiting for something to do, and you have zero latency, uh, wake-up latency. And the deeper you go, the, the more time it takes to wake up. So this is in microseconds. And the re residency time is the time that uh, the scheduler will um, try to approximate how many time you will stay asleep, and it will uh, use this residency, residency time to choose the sleep state that you will go in. So you can disable CPU idle uh, from the kernel command line, so you can choose the, the, the max uh, C state that you will use. You, you can disable it sometime in the BIOS. So on some platforms, for example, the one, the, the test bench uh, one, we couldn't disable it from the kernel, and uh, the, the decision of the sleep states was made uh, in, in, in a BIOS level, so you have to, to disable that in the BIOS. So that's pretty much uh, it. Uh, my hope was that we could have some feedback from you uh, users of the real-time patch, uh, if you also have anything to share. 
uh, if, if you also are more interested in the, the real-time patch, there are a, a lot of good talks uh, about it. Uh, a lot of them were, were gave by Steve Rostet. Uh, I think he also gave one on sketch deadline, but I cannot quote it on each and every line. Um, the real-time Linux on embedded multiple processor was the one I talked to you about, about resource sharing. Also a good talk about IRQs, if you want to understand how they are handled and vanilla in, in RT Linux. And also you have uh, the talk from yesterday about the real-time patch uh, that had a lot of good information. So thank you. Now if you have some feedback or questions. Uh, No question, no feedback. Yes? Oh, I can. Let me give you the mic. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for using Stress and Chi. It's a tool I've been writing to measure systems like this. <laughs> it helped um, me a lot. Yeah, the, the latest version has now a cyclic test built in. So okay. you can actually get a full histogram of latencies and all sorts of stuff related to real time performance measurement. Oh, that's great. I didn't so know about just it. Just to let you know that. Okay, so that's very useful anyway to benchmark uh, everything in your system and also to stress your system uh, besides. So, any other questions or feedback? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. 